Good morning, everybody. This should be the final part of this series, looking at the um, false confessions in the post DNA world series article uh, written in 2004 by none other than uh, Steve Drizzen and Richard Leo. Um, section B, closing open cases by falsely attributing unsolved murders to guilty defendants. The second category of false confessions involving serial killers contains cases in which interrogators persuaded a defendant who has killed to confess falsely to one or more other unsolved slayings. Although such confessions may close cases, they may do so with tragic consequences. For when the wrong perpetrator is apprehended, the real perpetrator is left free to roam the streets and victimise others. This appears to have been the case in the Chicago cases discussed below. Hubert Geralds, Derek Fluellen and Andre Crawford. Hubert Geralds, a mildly mentally retarded man whose IQ has been tested as low, to, as, low as 59, was convicted of six murders in 1997 and sentenced to death row. Convictions for two of those murders, including the murder of Rhonda King, were based solely on his confessions. In February 2000, the Cook County State Attorney's Office vacated Gerald's death sentence and convictions, saying he would be retried for all of the murders except that of Rhonda King. The charges against Gerald were dropped when a new serial killer emerged, Andre Crawford, who confessed on videotape in greater detail to the murder of King. Crawford was eventually charged with 10 rape murders in Chicago's Englewood neighborhood, where we've come across Englewood before. Um, maybe not the most pleasant place to live. Um, although Geralds was exonerated of the King murder, he was later implicated through DNA testing to the murder of Lovey Ford, a crime to which another man, Derek Fluellen, had falsely confessed. In June 1995, 30-year-old Derek Fluellen was walking out of a hospital where he had been treated for a dislocated toe when he was approached by two Chicago detectives who asked him to accompany them to the police station. After an, after an interrogation which lasted more than 36 hours, the detectives obtained a signed confession from Fluellen to the murders of Lovey Ford and Sherry Hunt. The only evidence linking Fluellen to these crimes were confessions that Fluellen claims were obtained through violence. A friend who was outside of the interrogation room during Fluellen's interrogation claimed to have heard screaming and noises consistent with Fluellen's allegations of coercive violence. No DNA evidence linked him to either crime, even though Fluellen's confession stated that the murders were committed after sexual intercourse. A test of semen taken from Miss Ford, however, was matched in late 1999 to Gerald's. Despite the DNA evidence linking Gerald to the crime, prosecutors took Fluellen to trial, arguing that Fluellen gave eight oral statements and a final written statement confessing to the crimes. Given the DNA evidence, however, Judge Marcus Salone acquitted Fluellen in November 1999. Fluellen filed a civil lawsuit against the city of Chicago and seven police officers, claiming that the officers framed him for the 1995 deaths of two women. The city of Chicago played, paid Fluellen $250,000 to settle his lawsuit. Section F. Prosecuting the false confessor. When evidence of a false confession comes to light, the integrity of the legal system is implicated. Also at stake is the integrity of the police officers who obtained the false confession and the prosecutors who charged and sometimes convicted the false confessor. Rather than admitting their errors, apologising to the wrong parties and officially exonerating the defendants, 
In several of the cases discussed herein, law enforcement officials continued to insist that the false confessors were guilty. In other cases, the authorities acknowledged that a false confession was obtained, but refused to accept any responsibility for the false confession. But perhaps the most egregious response to a false confession occurs when prosecutors bring obstruction of justice charges against false confessors or pressure innocent defendants into pleading guilty to lesser crimes in order to gain their release. There are several instances of such police and prosecutorial misconduct in our database, two of which are discussed below. David Saracino. As an 18-year-old troublemaker with a history of vandalism, David Saracino was a, highly sus was, was a likely suspect in the burning of a fleet of 15 school buses in Haddam, Connecticut. Detectives brought him into the station and interrogated him for over 10 hours until they finally obtained a confession from Saccarino that he and several accomplices torched the buses. As it turned out, the confession was false, coerced by tactics which apparently including threats that Saracino would be locked up in an adult jail where he would be raped. After his conviction on arson charges, and while his appeal was pending, private investigators discovered evidence implicating other suspects whom the state chose to protect rather than disclose to the defence. A new trial was ordered and the state allowed the statute of limitations to run out before charging the new suspects, one of whom had given a credible and detailed confession without coercion to Saracino's private investigator. Rather than dismiss the charges against Saracino, prosecutors offered him a deal, agreeing to remove the spectre of further prosecution in exchange for his no-contest plea to a lesser bus fire charge. When Saracino refused, they offered him a deal which required he plead to hindering pr prosecution by falsely confessing to get his life back on track and to stop draining his parents' finances, Saraceno, now 23 and a University of Connecticut student, took the deal. Teresa Sornberger. One day after a bank, bank was robbed, Teresa and Scott Sornberger were arrested and charged, based in part on an, on an identification of Scott, a bank patron, as the robber in the videotape surveillance. Teresa was brought in for questioning and confessed that her husband had committed the robbery and she had driven the getaway car. Scott Kornberger maintained his innocence throughout the investigation and no other evidence linked either of them to the crime. In the end, the Thornbergers were freed on a fluke. A local legislator, by chance, saw a television newscast about a bank robbery in a nearby town in which the suspect bore a striking resemblance to Sornberger. The FBI investigated this information and discovered from surveillance tapes that the same man had robbed both banks. The man, though resembling Sornberger, was not Sornberger. The two were freed, having spent a total of 118 days in jail. Sornberger, who recanted her confession soon after her arrest, claimed she had confessed only after police threatened to call child welfare authorities to have her children removed from her custody. The judge disbelieved this testimony and admitted the confession into evidence. After the truth came to light, Knox County State's attorney, Paul Manieri, announced that Sornberger's case Quote, shows the system works. How many times have we heard this? It shows the system works. It shows the complete opposite, you morons. Before she was released, however, Sornberger had to, had to plead guilty to obstructing justice for giving false information to authorities. So it really does bug me when, when we hear people like, you know, um, Orlando Hudson and others saying it just shows how, the, how well the system works. Well, if, if it showed how well the system works, why is Brendan Dassey still incarcerated? Why is Stephen Avery still incarcerated? There's corruption. Political gerrymandering. Anyway, finally, conclusion. Oh, calm down. 
The 125 proven false confessions analysed in this study should put to rest any doubts that modern psychological interrogation techniques can cause innocent suspects to confess. Like other studies, our research demonstrates the potentially deleterious and fateful consequences of confession evidence, even coerced, uncorroborated and ultimately false confession evidence, when put before a trier of fact. One of the most significant findings in this study is that more than four-fifths of the innocent defendants who chose to take their case to trial were wrongfully convicted, quote, beyond a reasonable doubt, even though their confession was ultimately demonstrated to be false. In other words, the factually innocent defendant who took his case to trial was approximately four times more likely to be convicted than acquitted, despite the many procedural safeguards Procedural safeguards, yeah, to keep people inside. So, procedural safeguards of trial rights of American criminal defendants. An additional 14 false confessors in this study chose to accept a plea bargain rather than take their case to trial, despite their factual innocence, typically to avoid the death penalty. Remarkably then, almost nine of every 10 of the individuals in our sample whose false confessions were not discovered by police or dismissed by prosecutors before trial, were eventually convicted. That false confessions are likely to lead to wrongful deprivations of liberty and convic convictions may no longer be a novel finding. This study adds to a growing body of research demonstrating the power of confession evidence to substantially prejudice a trier of facts ability to even handedly evaluate a criminal defendant's culpability. As both experimental and field studies have demonstrated, criminal officers and jurors often place almost blind faith in the evidentiary value of a confession of confession evidence, even when, as in all the cases in this study, the confession was not accompanied by any credible corroboration and there was compelling evidence of the defendant's innocence. Criminal justice officials and lay jurors who prosecute and convict false confessors in such high percentages appear to treat confession evidence as more probative than any other piece of case evidence and thus as essentially dispositive to the defendant's guilt, even when the confession lacks corroboration and is almost certainly the product of psychological coercion and or police misconduct. The 125 proven false confession cases analysed in this article demonstrate that interrogation-induced false confessions may be, more, may be a more serious problem than previously imagined, I think you might be right, Steve. These cases ought to compel all who care about the credibility of the American criminal legal system to devise better ways to reduce or eliminate the number of false confessions and the risk they pose for the innocent. It behooves criminal justice officials not to acknowledge and better understand the role that false confessions play in creating and perpetrating miscarriages of justice, but also to introduce meaningful reforms that will prevent false confessions from occurring or leading to the wrongful conviction and or incarceration of the innocent. The risk of harm caused by false confessions could be greatly reduced if police were required to electronically record the entirety of all custodial interrogations of suspects. Now remember, this is 2004. Brendan wasn't interviewed till 2006. So, you know, fair enough, um, that, that bit has been introduced. Unlike some potential reforms, the recording of police interrogation is not an ad adversarial policy suggestion. It favours neither the defence nor the prosecution, but only the pursuit of reliable and accurate fa fact-finding. For at least three reasons, American police should be required to electronically record the entirety of their interrogations. First, taping interrogations creates an objective, comprehensive and viewable record of the interrogation. With taping, it is no longer necessary to rely on subjective credibility judgments to resolve, quote, swearing contests. 
between the police and the defendant about what occurred during interrogation. Unlike the testimony of two disputants, the videotape does not suffer from the fallibility and biases of human memory and judgment, but instead preserves a record of the interrogation that is complete and factually accurate. A videotape will capture any police abuses and or improprieties, as well as protect detectives from false accusations. By preserving the record, Taping removes the secrecy of interrogation and makes it accessible to criminal officials and triers of facts, thus rendering the fact-finding process more accurate and reliable. Second, taping leads to a higher level of scrutiny by police officials as well as others that will deter police misconduct during interrogation, improve the quality of interrogation practices and thus increase the ability of police to separate the innocent from the guilty. Interrogators are less likely to resort to improper interrogation practices when the camera is rolling, and thus they are less likely to coerce an innocent suspect into falsely confessing. Well, I guess we get the fast bender were still operating on the old system and forgot that they were being uh, videotaped. Third, a taping requirement creates the opportunity for various criminal officials to move to more closely monitor both the quality of police interrogation and the reliability of confession statements. With taping, detectives, police managers, prosecutors and judges are able to more easily detect false confessions and thus more easily prevent their admission into evidence. I can't see that happening in Brendan's. I just don't see that that, that was the case in, in, in Brendan's scenario. Okay. Inevitably, however, some unreliable confessions will still make it into evidence at trial. Hmm. A videotaping requirement, however, allows jurors to make a more informed evaluation of the quality of the interrogation and the reliability of the defendant's confession, and thus to make a more informed decision about what weight to place on co confession evidence. As others have demonstrated, virtually all false confessions in America occur because of psychologically coercive interrogation methods and strategies, police overreaching and or police misconduct. Well, yes, which in the type of cases analysed in this article is usually alleged but almost never memorialised. While there is no better way for police officers, prosecutors, judges and juries to learn the truth of what occurred in the interrogation room than to see a videotape of the entire interrogation process, presently only three states require that police electronically record interrogations. In both Alaska and Minnesota, the taping requirement was imposed by each state's Supreme Court in July 2003. Illinois became the first state to mandate legislatively legislatively, the electronic recording of interrogations when Governor Rod Blagojevich signed into law a bill that will require law enforcement officers to tape interrogations in homicide cases beginning in July 2005. Although Illinois was the only state to pass such a law in the last legislative, legislative session, many other states introduced legislation in this area in the last legislative session and in the wake of Illinois' action, editorial boards from newspapers from around the country have called for taping. More progress has been made regarding taping in interrogations at the local level. In April of 2001, a series of articles in the Washington Post highlighted several false confessions obtained by Prince George's County, Maryland. Police officers led County Attorney Jack Johnson to insist that all interrogations in serious felonies be tape recorded. After some initial opposition, the Prince George's County, Maryland Police Department agreed to implement the taping policies. A similar expose in the Miami Herald in December of 2002 spotlighted a problem of false confessions obtained by the Broward County Sheriff's Office. The series led Broward County State's Attorney Michael Satz to pressure local police officers to start taping interrogations. First, Fort Lauderdale's police department announced plans to start taping interrogations, and shortly thereafter, 
Broward County Sheriff Ken Jen, who just days before had opposed taping, shifted gears and announced that his department would be, begin taping all interrogations in 17 of the most serious felonies. A few days later, Miami P Police Chief John Timoney announced that his officers would follow Broward's lead and institute a taping policy. In Chicago, a series of high-profile false conviction cases, including the Ryan Harris case and the Laurie Roschetti case, spurred calls for a statewide bill to mandate taping of interrogations. These calls grew to a fever pitch after the Chicago Tribune produced a series on false confessions in December 2001. In response to the Ryan Harris case, Cook County State's Attorney Richard Devine instituted a program in which his prosecutors obtained suspects' confessions on videotape. The flaws of taping, only the final confession, became evident, however, in December 2001, when the first videotaped false confession surfaced in the murder case of Carithian Bell. After some 50 hours of interrogation, Chicago police officers got Bell to confess on videotape to the murder and sexual assault of his mother. When DNA test results exonerated Bell and implicated another man who had a history of sexually assaulting women in Bell's neighbourhood, Cook County prosecutors were forced to drop charges against Bell and agree to his release. The Bell case, the Rosette Roschetti case, the Ryan Harris case and several others finally led Cook County State's Attorney Devine to endorse a bill which would require all Illinois police officers to tape custodial interrogations of suspects in homicide cases. With the support of the Cook County State's Attorney, the bill passed the Illinois Senate by a vote of 58 to nil and the Illinois House by a vote of 109 to 7. With such overwhelming legislative support, Governor Blagojevic, a former prosecutor, was hard-pressed to veto the bill, even though he had opposed videotaping interrogations during his run for governor. Blagojevic had supported the taping only of confessions, fearing that a policy of taping interrogations would make it more difficult for police officers to obtain confessions from suspects. He acknowledged his change of heart when he signed the bill into law, citing the fact that he became persuaded that taping would help us make sure that the evidence we have is more reliable and more accurate and give us a better chance of doing justice. We also recommend greater education and training of American police about the causes, indicia and consequences of false confessions. American police are poorly trained to understand the psychology of interrogation, suspect decision-making and confession, to evaluate the likely unreliability of confession statements and to recognise and prevent false confessions. Um, I think Regan and Fassmender must be the dimmest investigators of all time if they couldn't see that Brendan was just making up everything that he was saying about any, any involvement in attacking Teresa. But, uh, OK, because they are not properly trained, most interrogators do not realise how their commonly taught and practised methods of psychological interrogation can set up an innocent person to make a false confession. To reduce the number of false confessions, police interrogation training needs to be significantly improved in at least four ways. First, Contrary to their current training and practice, interrogators need to be taught they cannot reliable, reliably intuit whether a suspect is innocent or guilty based on hunches about the meaning of a suspect's demeanour, body language and or non-verbal behaviours. Re regrettably, American police interrogators have created a folk psychology of human lie detection that is based more kin to the witch-finding techniques of the 1690s than to the methods of modern science. I particularly like that line, Steve, that's very good. Contrary to the police interrogation industry's beliefs, the scientific research literature has repeatedly and unequivocally demonstrated that interrogators' deception, 
detection training materials are flawed and that their detection, deception, judgments are highly prone to error and, perhaps not surprisingly, that interrogators cannot accurately assess their own lie detection skills. Despite this, interrogators' pseudo-scientific training in behaviour analysis falsely increases their confidence in their lie detection skills, rendering them even more certain in their erroneous beliefs, even though it does not increase their ability to discern truth from deception. This is significant because interrogators wrongly but confidently presume a suspect must be guilty merely because of his non-verbal behaviour during their initial interaction rather than because of any reasonable evidence linking the suspect to the crime. Because the interrogator falsely assumes that the suspect is behaving in ways indicative of guilt, he subjects the innocent suspect to the manipulative methods of modern accusatorial interrogation. Once the interrogator elicits a confession, he treats the fact that the suspect has confessed as confirming his initial presumption of the suspect's guilt, even if the interrogator relied on psychologically coercive methods to extract the, con extract the confession and or the resulting statement does not fit the facts of the crime. And once there is a confession, the innocent suspect may be well on his way to a wrongful conviction. Because the psychological methods of modern interrogation are sufficiently powerful to induce false confessions from the innocent, no individual, individual should ever be interrogated unless there is a reasonable basis for believing in the probability of his guilt. Police interrogators need to be properly trained to understand that they are not human lie detectors and that they endanger the innocent when based merely on their guesses about the meaning of a person's demeanour, they subject him to a to high-pressure custodial interrogation. Second, detectives need to receive better training about the existence, variety and courses of false confession, the logic of modern interrogation and how it works. Contrary to current practice, interrogation trainers and training manuals must stop perpetuating the main myth of psychological interrogation. Interrogators need to be taught that their psychological interrogation techniques can and do cause innocent suspects who are cognitively normal to falsely confess. More importantly, interrogators need to be shown why their commonly taught and commonly practiced interrogation methods, such as maximization and minimization strategies, lead to the decision to confess from the guilty as well as the innocent. If interrogators are taught the logic, principles and effects of their psychological methods, they will not only be more knowledgeable about the causes of false confession, but they will be more effective at elicit eliciting truthful ones. In addition to receiving better education and training about the psychology of interrogation and confession, detectives need to be taught about the different types of false confession, their distinguishing characteristics and how to prevent them. Third, interrogators need to receive better training about the indicia of reliable and unreliable statements and how to properly distinguish them. It has long been a generally accepted principle in law enforcement as well as among social scientists and legal scholars, that valid confessions will be supported by logic and evidence, whereas false ones will not be. In practice, however, detectives virtually always treat a suspect's I did it statement as if it is automatically self-validating, even if it fails to be supported by logic or evidence, merely because it validates their own presumption of the suspect's guilt. As Offshi and Leo have pointed out, a suspect's I did it statement may turn out to be either evidence of innocence or evidence of guilt. Initially, it should be treated as a neutral hypothesis to be objectively tested against the case, case facts. De That's certainly what Brendan was hoping. Detectives need to be taught that the proper way to assess the likely reliability of a suspect's confession is by analysing the fit of the suspect's post-admission narrative against the underlying crime facts to determine whether it reveals guilty knowledge and is corroborated by existing evidence. 
Assuming no contamination, a guilty suspect's post-admission narrative will reveal knowledge that is known only to the two true perpetrator and or police, lead to new or derivative evidence explaining seeming an anomalies or otherwise inexplicable crime facts and be corroborated by existing physical and medical evidence. An innocent suspect's post-admission narrative will reveal the opposite. Police interrogators need to be trained to recognise their own confirmation biases, to initially treat admission statements as neutral hypotheses, to be tested against objective case facts, and to systematically analyse the probative value of a suspect's post-admission narrative, if they are to reduce the likelihood of false confessions leading to wrongful deprivations of liber liberty and miscarriages of justice in the first place. Finally, interrogators need to re receive specialised training in how to interrogate persons with developmental disabilities and juveniles, two subgroups of suspects who appear to be particularly vulnerable to falsely confessing when police apply psychological interrogation techniques To them. In Broward County, Florida, for example, several false confessions involving developmentally disabled suspects led Sheriff Ken Jen to adopt new policies for inter interrogating such subjects. Pursuant to this new policy, each Broward County detective must annually receive specialised training to assist them in recognising the characteristics of a developmentally disabled suspect and on how to properly question them to avoid or minimise the risk of false confessions. Before questioning a developmentally disabled person, Broward County detectives are instructed, instructed to immediately notify their supervisors and to make a reasonable effort to notify and afford an appropriate adult the opportunity to be present during, during all questioning. Interrogators are also instructed to take special care in advising developmentally disabled suspects of their constitutional rights, requiring them to speak slowly and clearly and ask subjects to explain their responses rather than simply answer yes or no. Because the developmentally disabled are easily persuaded and eager to please authority figures, detectives are trained to avoid leading or subjective questions and questions that tell the suspect the answer the detectives expect. Which is certainly very much the case in Brendan. He just agrees to everything. Well, it, it fails to argue at all with what uh, Wiegert and Fassbender are saying to him. They never shut up, um, Brendan. Uh, hardly says anything of any substance, unless it's been fair to him, of course. But we've been through all of that. OK, let's finish off. As a final check against called false confessions, before a developmentally disabled suspect can be charged with a crime, each confession taken from a devent developmentally disabled suspect must undergo a thorough post-confession analysis by a unit supervisor, or, if there is no evidence corroborating the confession by a team consisting of a psychologist, an assistant state's attorney and a criminal investigation commander. This evaluation involves weighing numerous factors, including whether the suspect was able to provide an accurate description of the major and minor details of the crime and its scene, whether the suspect was able to identify unusual or unique elements of the crime or its scene, which were not publicly known, and whether the suspect provided information to the police that led to the discovery of other previously unknown evidence. Because juvenile suspects share many of the same characteristics as the developmentally disabled, notably their eagerness to comply with adult authority figures, impulsive, impulsivity, immature judgment, and inability to recognise and raise risks in decision-making and appear to be at a greater risk of falsely confessing when subjected to the psychological interrogation techniques. The same protections should be afforded to juveniles. In fact, in the wake of the Ryan Harris case and several other false confessions include, involving children and teenagers in, in Chicago, 
Illinois enacted a law requiring that all children under age 13 be provided access to attorneys before their interrogations in murder and sex offence cases. Moreover, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office convened the Juvenile Court Competency Commission, a panel of experts from many disciplines, including child development specialists, child psychiatrists and psychologists, service providers, law enforcement personnel, prosecutors, judges, defenders, disability advocates and educators to study the ability of young people to understand and meanif meaningfully participate in the interrogation process, process and court proceedings. The Commission recommended even broader reforms, including barring the state from using any uncancelled statements against children under age 17 in any unresolved, un uncancelled statements against children under age 17 in any proceedings in which children face potential adult punishments, a requirement that the entire custod custodial interrogation of a juveniles charged with felonies be videotaped and that more effective procedures be developed to ensure that a minor's parent or guardian is present during police questioning. Prosecutors and judges should also receive the training that we are recommending for police personnel. Armed with this knowledge, both judges and prosecutors could act as a check against the admission of false confession evidence in court proceedings. The earlier that a false confession is detected, the less damage it will do to the defendant, the credibility of police and prosecutors, and the integrity of the system. Because of the revelatory power of DNA technology to expose confessions as false or at the very least as untrustworthy, we recommend that DNA testing be conducted as soon as possible in all confession cases in which there is evidence to test. At the very least, the testing should be conducted before pre-trial motions to suppress confessions are litigated. Once a judge determines that a confession is admissible in evidence against the defendant, the chances of gaining a conviction for police and prosecutors, even in cases in which the confession is demonstrably false, increases significantly. The fact that a conviction is virtually assured can blind some prosecutors to their ethical obligation to pursue the truth and seek justice. Requiring, requiring DNA testing before motions to, to suppress are litigated not only will minimise the chances that false confession evidence will lead to wrongful convictions, it might also act as a check against overzealous prosecutions. Although the existence of false confessions will spur reform efforts, the more likely impetus for reform, however, however, will be the pressure from within the ranks of law enforcement, particularly from prosecutors and other police groups. As the number of these reform-minded law enforcement agencies grow, those that continue to resist reform will become increasingly isolated. On January 30, 2003, James Kindler, the Deputy Assistant District Attorney from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office testified before a subcommittee of the New York City Council about the office's lengthy reinvestigation of the Central Park case. In testimony that was long on what went wrong, but short on details about how to prevent such tragedies from a recurring, Kindler stated, whatever else may be said, it is a simple fact that even the best detectives and prosecutors need all the help they can get to arrive at the truth, which may be elusive. The reforms we have suggested give police, prosecutors, judges and jurors the tools they need to discover the truth. Well, thanks for bearing with me. I thought that final um, episode, the conclusion episode, was particularly interesting. Um, obviously, I've got a few questions. Um, Hopefully I'll get the chance to have a, a wee bit chat with um, the hard and the dude. Um, because, you know, as I say, this article was pre, two years before um, Brendan was interrogated. Um, was, it a, was it accidental that Wiegert and Fassbender got that confession out of Brendan? I don't believe so. I believe it was totally political. I believe it was merely a case of trying to coach, coach Brendan 
into taking a plea, plea deal and to learn what he needed to say when he gave evidence. Um, I, I have never come across any evidence to suggest otherwise. Um, I think it's quite clear. Um, and it just beggars belief that he's still, still locked up, even when we hear Seth Laxman saying that not a single judge, not a single judge, accepts that Brendan Dassey is guilty and yet he's still locked up. My suggestion, I think some people over there need to be, as with Kathleen Zellner, they need to be a little bit more abrasive. The nicey-nicey, softly spoken approach is not getting us anywhere quickly. The time for really laying it down as to what needs to be done in this case, I, I, I think has, has been long gone. But, as I say, abrasive. That, that, that's the word I would use. Let's, let's, let's see a little bit more passion for um, exposing what's going on in this case. Sheer corruption, uh, purely political. Uh, you know, we're looking at the the gerrymandering of the um, legal system by Sukovic. Just absolutely appalling. Anyway, um, as I say, plenty to discuss maybe in a future live event. Thanks for, thanks for, <laughs> for um, joining me for all of these. It's been pretty, pretty extensive. Um, I think very interesting, very informative. I certainly feel as if I've learned quite a lot more than I did about uh, wrong confessions. Um, it was interesting to read through all of the different cases um, and examples. Interesting to see so many similarities between them. Um, and, you know, as I say, there was only one, one person, the, um, the head of the read technique, that suggested that, um, that, that, you know, well, not in this article, but in the Saul Kassan article, to ever suggest that uh, false confessions are um, anything other than, than that, that there is um, no problem with the way that pe people are interrogated. I think quite clearly, um, as Saul Kassan said, that, you know, um, this, this adoption of letting the um, people being interrogated, let them do the speaking. If they've got anything to say, then they'll say it. Then you can always trip them up with what they've said. Um, but just feeding them the information, you're not going to get rid of these false confessions. But when you do, clearly, you know, anybody with, with any, any, any ounce of, um, of common sense can see straight away how easily Brendan was manipulated, what he said all the way through was just a guess, how he was hoping. He was hoping that, you know, the investigators would go away, come back and say, you know what, Brendan, we've, we've checked through all this, it just, just doesn't add up. Of course, that wasn't the case, because they kept telling him, we know what happened, we just need you to, to say it. And of course, he had no, no idea of, of what he was what he was doing to himself. A little bit like, as Saul Kinsan says, the reverse of the Milgram experiment. You know, instead of electrocuting other people for getting it wrong, he was electrocuting himself, damaging himself very badly, and of course, ultimately, leading to a, press, a, a bizarre, absurd press conference that in this country would have been illegal. And not only that, but more, more interestingly, as Jerry said yesterday, any reporter who had reported on that press conference would be held in contempt of court by the judge when the, when the case came to trial. So in other words, you know, don't just blame Ken Kratz, but blame the people, the journalists, that were quite happy to disseminate this information as if this is, this is fact, this is what happened. They wanted the most gory, um, awful a story they could possibly have so that they could spread it far and wide across Wisconsin in order to bury Stephen Brendan alive. Anyway, we'll uh, catch you again soon. Bye for now.